Are you guilty of turning to the internet for medical advice, diet advice, or a simple explanation for a complex scientific issue? Lots of people do it. However, there is a lot of bad science on the web. The science babe, as she is known on her blog, has made it her goal to expose some of this bad science. And she joins us now for more. In Irvine, California, there's Yvette Dontremont. She is the science babe. And Yvette, it's, uh, I'm not going to call you babe, okay? Yvette, I'm just going to call you Yvette. Is that okay? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's absolutely fine. Thank okay. you. I want to just start by um, focusing on, on something that apparently was a problem for you when you were in your 20s. You wrote about it on your blog that you had a weight problem and you started to go online looking for ideas. What did you find and what did you think? Well, it wasn't necessarily because I had a weight problem. I got very, very sick. I had a very bad headache on one side of my head that just showed up one day, never went away. And I was obviously working with doctors too, but while you're waiting for relief, you start looking at health bloggers. And when you're looking at health bloggers and food bloggers, you might not be getting a reputable source of information. And every blogger had a different idea. Some of them said that it was, I needed to go organic. Some said I needed to go vegan, that I needed to go paleo. And everyone had a different source of information and all the while I was waiting for some doctor to figure out what I needed to do and eventually I found a, a cure or a treatment with with medicine with correct medicine but of course I eventually landed on the food babe and I landed on people like Mike Adams and le people like Dr. Oz who all had a different answer and none of them seemed to line up with what science said was a correct course of treatment and I looked at all all of the things they were saying and none of them seemed to have scientific veracity. Well, Dr. Oz is going through his own problems right now for uh, you know very appropriate it's, reasons, but t talk to us about Food Babe. Yes. Who is she and what did you think of what she recommended? Well, the Food Babe, she, her background is in computer science and she kept saying things like you need to go organic, you need to cut out GMOs, you need to cut out a lot of whole food groups from your diet in order to find health. And she started her journey when likewise she had a health problem, she had appendicitis. And here's what I thought was kind of funny. The thing that solved her, her appendicitis was of course doctors. She went to the hospital and she had doctors perform a surgery on her that fixed that health problem. And then she claimed that all her other tiny little little health problems were solved by going organic and cutting things out of her diet. And she claims that little health problems of hers were solved and that you can solve all of your health problems by changing your diet. And this, I think, goes, uh, goes very outside of mainstream medical thinking. And she gives a lot of advice that really, when you look closely at it, doesn't line up with, with modern medicine or with anything that has proof to it. Now, Yvette, you do have a way of poking holes in the arguments of those who you don't respect. And, well, for example, the, um, the piece you wrote about the food babe, I'm not sure I can say it on the air. It said the food babe blogger is full of, okay, we're looking full at it right shit. now. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, you said it. Um, yeah, here's the thing. Well, I wrote you, it, so you've I'll got say a, it. You've got a BS in chemistry. You've got an MS in forensic science. You've worked as a professor. You've mm -hmm. worked as an explosives chemist, a toxicologist chemist, uh, an analytical chemist. You, you've got the chops, no doubt, but you do like to drop Absolutely. the odd F-bomb. How come you do that? It's uh, how, how, why do I do it? Yeah. Or it's, it's, I think, well, partially that's because how I talk. <laughs> it's just, I mean, as I, I've watched uh, different comedians say, um, I think I saw, saw this from Louis C.K. once, you know, Jerry Seinfeld doesn't swear. I do swear. This is just how some people work. It's just how I talk and it's how I communicate. And I like to say I'm the scientist as drinking buddy. I think part of the reason it's an effective tool is because people, when they're listening to a scientist, they don't want to feel like they're in a high school chemistry class again. I mean, why didn't people enjoy chemistry class it's because it felt like chemistry class <laughs> you know you don't want to feel like when you're reading an article on the internet that you're back in school you want to feel like you're you know enjoying some time with friends and I think that's why the article was so effective it got I think over 4.7 million views at this point and it's because people didn't feel like they were in class they were reading something they enjoyed they felt like they were talking to a friend and it was such an effective tool not just because of the swears but because it was funny and I mean I also have a theater degree so I know kind of of how to be an effective communicator by talking to people like I'm talking to a friend. So I'm able to break down the science by having a conversation with people. And I think that's part of the wonderful thing is that we have different ways we can talk about science to people. Gotcha. Food Babe talked about Girl Guide cookies, Girl Scout cookies, which are an yes. example <laughs> of GMO foods. And you wrote in response to her piece, as for those GMOs in the Girl Scout cookies, fret ye not. In order to introduce a genetically modified crop into the food supply, 
they have to be proven to be nutritionally indistinguishable from their non-GM counterparts. So what ingredient in Girl yes. Scout cookies is worrisome, do you think, to the, to the food babe? It's, I haven't looked too deeply into which ingredient in the, uh, in the Girl Scout cookies are GMO. I mean, some of the oils sometimes are derived from genetically modified crops, and sometimes it's sugar is, GM, is derived from genetically modified uh, beets. So it's, it depends on the, uh, on the genetically modified, or sorry, on the cookie that we're, that's in question. But there are different ingredients that are de derived from genetically modified crop. Uh, I think that we have to remember in a lot of cases that we have to look at why a crop was genetically modified because I think that when people start demonizing genetically modified crops they don't look at the reason why a crop was genetically modified to start with. We genetically modify things not to, to make money for evil Monsanto. That's just a way that people start demonizing something that they don't understand and I think that's a really big red herring in science that people use to, to just you know make people afraid of their food and that's a big problem. Problem. So look at look at the reasons why things are genetically modified. Ask a scientist and ask a farmer. These are tools that we use in farming because right now feeding people is a technological problem. It's not a problem that's just something that we use to, to give Monsanto money. It's something that we use in technology to help farmers. Like I said, ask a farmer, ask a scientist, don't ask a food blogger. David Suzuki is a well-known guy here in Canada. He's had his own television show on CBC for uh, more than a couple of decades. He's quite anti-GMO, and you wrote about it on your Science Babe blog. And we've got, uh, you actually linked to something, a little presentation that we want to show a clip of right now, and then we'll come back and chat. So let's roll the clip, please. Now we're fooling around with the very stuff of, of life, the genetic information. And we are really caught up in the idea, that while a gene is a gene, it's just a piece of DNA with a specific amount of information, and we can flip one that from, from here to here. Take a gene for, uh, 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 that will allow uh, a cod, a fish, or flounder to live below zero. It, it's got its own antifreeze, and stick that gene from the fish into a strawberry plant so it's, it's now frost-free. And you can do that manipulation. But that's kind of like taking Mick Jagger out of the Rolling Stones and sticking him in with the symphony, uh, the, the Sydney Symphony, and saying, now make music. Now that's a cute line, but what do you think he's got wrong here? It's, well, I, I'm not sure why they always do this. They always do the, like, the fish. It's always when you see a picture from somebody that's demonizing GMOs, it's always the, like a fish tail or a syringe, and they're always sticking it in a tomato or a strawberry. And it's always that horrible visual that they use to demonize GMOs. And again, it's always somebody with a really happy little face that's using to demonize something that looks ugly. And I, I promise you, it was me personally sticking all the fishtails right in the tomatoes. It's what I did for work. No, I promise that's not what <laughs> happened. But this is not how this works. It's a much more targeted approach. And we have to remember that the crops we have now are very different than the crops we had once upon a time when we, were, when we weren't uh, an agricultural-based society. So people were always kind of going in and trying to target these crops and make them much more, uh, much more nutritionally approachable and much more easy to, uh, to get what we needed out of the crops. But now when we go in and do genetic, uh, I guess, manipulation and genetically change the crops in, in the lab, we're taking one or two genes out of tens of thousands and giving them a trait that makes them easier for the farmers to work with. We're taking and putting a gene in that makes them resistant to the rust fungus. We're taking, we actually saved the Hawaiian papaya farmers from complete disaster when we gave them a bit of a vaccine almost to, uh, to the ring spot virus. We're giving these farmers tools that they need to succeed and giving people more access to crops. So this is not something that we're doing to just to, to poison the food supply or to make an experiment on people like people are claiming. This is giving people food and giving people, uh, giving farmers tools. So I think that when people always put the fishtail in the tomato, that's just such a, a horrible visual that people see. And it's not, we're, we're not manipulating the food supply like that. Like I said, one or two genes out of tens of thousands. So when you see that, you're, you're looking at somebody who's not, like I said, not a farmer, not a scientist. What's your view about putting a GMO label on foods that have been genetically modified? 
It's, I think that it's, it's completely unnecessary because whenever people do that, I think it's a way of making people afraid of their food. Hmm. Is your, how do I ask this? Is your own pro-GMA stance affected at all by the fact that you used to analyze pesticides for safety in your past? It's, well, I, I don't think so. I think part of my stance is because I'm pro-science, and it's not, it's, I, I think that working with the pesticides let me know how much regulation and how much testing there is that goes into it. So in a way, possibly, but only because I know the amount of testing that goes into it. So if I think if I hadn't seen that side of it and how much testing there is, like I would work on making sure that an instrument ha was so precise sometimes for two weeks because I saw that there was a flaw in the machine. I would make sure that something was working accurately for two weeks if I saw there was a problem to make sure that there, wasn't, there weren't any inaccurate results going out to people. So I mean, I knew I was just one cog in the wheel and I know that people can lose careers if they have any inaccurate data going out and I, I know that there is there is integrity in science that there are integrity in scientists and that things get reported out if there's anything wrong with the data eventually so I, I I trust the integrity of scientists and I trust the integrity of other scientists too so I want people to know that this data gets looked over I want people to know that scientists are not <laughs> these horrible nefarious people that would cover things up and I, I want people to remember that we're human beings with you know I put pictures of my dog on my site all the time you know we're, we're humans with puppies and boyfriends and parents and you know we're people who work very hard to make sure that the products we put out are safe for for us because you know we eat the food too so I think that having that perspective of somebody who's worked behind the scenes it's not because I'm advocating for something I worked on it's because I'm advocating as someone who's seen the amount of testing goes into this so I know it's safe because I wouldn't put a product out that I wouldn't eat myself no I hear you but I wonder you know journalists are supposed to poke around at things and, and language is important yeah. so I absolutely. I notice the words absolutely pro you know the pro GMO side of the debate says that that if products are treated this way they are nutritionally indistinguishable from yes. non-GMO foods. And I just want to be sure that nutritionally indistinguishable yeah, yeah. also means safe. Yes. It's, I, I would absolutely say, uh, cross my heart, uh, this, these are safe. They, they're, there's been so much safety testing, and I, I like to say whenever people say there's no safety testing, because I, I never, I didn't work at a company that that made GMOs or tested GMOs. Um, so when people say that pesticides aren't, uh, aren't tested, I'm like, yes, I basically just licked the vials and said, these probably aren't gonna kill your kids. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to say, of uh, to quote that as though I wasn't being sarcastic. Um, but no, this, these things are absolutely safety tested and these are absolutely tested to make sure that, there's, that there isn't harm that's gonna come to you. I, and at one point, because you asked how I came across Vani Hari and the Food Babe, I at one point was, you know, I bought into it because I was scared and I was sick, um, as, you, as you brought up. I, I cut these out of my diet because I thought that they might be scary. And eventually I looked into it more and I reintroduced them into my diet because I, I did buy into the fear and eventually looked into it more and saw that they were tested. And there is nothing to be afraid of with these because there are good scientists and there are scientists who are just as ethical as, as I am. And I think same thing as me. If one day I found out that I was wrong, I would come on television again and say I was wrong and that there's something wrong with them. But at this point with the data and research that we have, it looks like there's nothing to be afraid of and that they're safe. Okay, Yvette, I wanna play one more clip from the same David Absolutely. Suzuki Q&A session that we played a little bit earlier and then we'll come back and chat after that one as well. Roll it, please. GMOs are very, very expensive. Now, the people that, that need this, this food are not going to be able to afford it. Are we going to just create these new crops and then give them away? I simply don't believe that's what's going to happen. I don't think it's a generosity for the rest of humanity that uh, is driving actually, this activity. Actually, we are. I mean, BT corn technology has been given away to the Kenyan state government research people for use for subsistence farmers. Monsanto gave away insect-resistant potatoes in Mexico over 20 years ago. J James is working on lots of similar cases. In cases where there's no um, economic return, it, it is, in fact, being given away, and they're not so difficult to develop. When I was at Cornell, we got a gene that was a gift from Monsanto for experimental purposes. We made broccoli plants that were resistant to the attacks of dimeback moths. 
a student, one of our students made 50 transformants in about 60, six months. The great cost of these things are no longer the actual creation of the plant. It's the regulatory challenges to make sure that you can take in the market to do all that safety testing. Okay, Rick, well, we get a response to that and we'll move on. Well, I don't have any response. It sounds great. I don't know. <laughs> uh, do you believe, Yvette, that GMOs and the companies who make them are, in effect, going to save the world? It's, well, save the world is a little bit of a high charge, I guess I would say. But I think that the companies that are making them, I mean, yeah, they're companies. They are out to make money. But at the same time, they are making crops that are giving solutions that are feeding people that wouldn't have access to these otherwise. I mean, in countries that are suffering with starvation, they have soil, they have water, they have sunlight. What they lack is the technology that can make crops grow. What they lack are, are genetically uh, altered crops that can that can grow under uh, under conditions that don't quite have enough water. They need these crops. I mean, every year we have, I think, between half a million and a million people that go blind because of vitamin A deficiency and golden rice is a solution for this because they have conditions where they can grow the rice. They might not have conditions where they can grow sweet potatoes or where they can grow other crops that are vitamin A rich. So golden rice is a wonderful solution for this. And I, I don't even think it's uh, from Monsanto that's very commonly demonized. So genetically modified crops, we've been doing things that have, that have changed the genetics of crops without genetic modification for years. Genetic modification is just a new tool of science. And what I love about, uh, about arguing against genetic modification is so often when we're arguing on the internet, we're arguing from our iPhones. <laughs> we're saying <laughs> we can't use technology and we're arguing against this from a technological wonder. So I think that we need to remember what that technology has so often done wonderful things for us that we need to stop arguing against it in farming. So please, like I said, ask a scientist when you're looking at this. And GMOs are absolutely going to help the way forward. And ask a scientist how safe it is. Because I know wonderful scientists like Kevin Folta, wonderful scientists like Joe Schwartz, they're going to do wonderful things for us. And they're going to communicate to you how good these are and how safe they are. And they're going to give us things that are going to help in the future. Joe is actually on the program in our next segment. You'll You'll be glad oh. to know. In our last 30 it's, seconds here, a, though. He's a friend of mine. I'm he's a, a friend. Well, we'll pass on your best wishes, of yeah. course. Uh, in our last <laughs> 30 you. seconds, do you think there's anything of that, uh, any legitimate concern at all about GMOs? It's. I think if anything, the only concern that there might be is that people like uh, the food babe are raising so much uh, kerfuffle about them that we're going to stop, pe stop people who are being mal malnourished from getting them in time to stop uh, starvation. Understood. Uh, Yvette Dantremont, <laughs> the science babe, we're so glad to have you on the program tonight from Irvine, California. Thanks for joining us on TVO. Thank you for having me. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.